All right, I'm rolling. John. Yeah, what's up? So I'm reading this book, and I'm pretty sure you've read it because, I mean, you've talked about what's in it a lot. Okay. But it's uh, Fear and Trembling. Oh, by Soren Kierkegaard. Yeah. Have you read it? Yeah, I have. I've read the first little bit. It's taken me a while to go through it because, like, there's so much to it. Yeah. It's, but it hasn't answered. I, it's just brought up so many questions. What part are you at right now? I mean, it's hard to describe because it's not like a story. But a little bit past the, the problemata preamble from the heart, like a couple of pages after that. It's a rather short book. I'm on page 62 of 148. Did you get the edition with repetition attached to it also? No, I got Penguin Classics. Penguin Classics. Okay. How did you come across this? Well, I was at Barnes & Noble, you know, getting like some books and yeah. I was over in that area um, okay I think it was like the philosophy area and I saw it and I was like Kierkegaard I was like oh yeah Taylor had mentioned this one Fear and Trembling and he really likes Kierkegaard and stuff but I'm like I don't know if I'll be able to read it because I read the first paragraph of his other work what was it sickness unto death and you, I, that well, went that's right because i was head. reading it right yeah that went right over my head and it was exhausting right so, no fear and trembling is a bit easier to understand yes and what i was gonna say is it is so well written yeah i think so too oh my gosh it's like i don't know why but i just like when i'm reading it i'm just like hooked i don't know why i'm hooked because it's it's not like a a story per se and it's right and it's not like a light read either it brings up some heavy topics no he just writes it well yeah he does i remember when i was reading that book i think i read it in maybe a day and a half yeah that sounds about right yeah it's it's not that long but there was one part and I just like blew my mind already. Which, and it's like at the very beginning, it was talking about Abraham's faith. And it was saying, right. I mean, I guess that's the whole thing. But this was talking about if Abraham had said that it's okay if it's not in your will that I should have a son. Uh, if it's not in your will, I'll give up my desire. It was my only desire, my blessed joy. My soul is upright. I can bear no secret grudge against you because you refused it. He would not have been forgotten. He would have saved many by his example, yet he would not have become the father of faith. For it is great to give up one's desire, but greater to stick to it after having given it up. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then he just keeps talking about it and how his faith and belief that he could still, belief in his youthful dreams, belief that he could still have a son, was what kept him young and i was like what is that and there's just so many implications it's like dude well can i read my favorite part from this book to you uh yeah so i think i think you actually just kind of read over it but i might have a different translation so is that at the beginning it's close to the beginning mine says no No one who was great in the world will be forgotten, but everyone was great in his own way, and everyone in proportion to the greatness of that which he loved. I remember this part. He who loved himself became great by virtue of himself, and he who loved other men became great by his devotedness, but he who loved God became greatest of all. Everyone shall be remembered, but everyone became great in proportion to his expectancy. One became great by expecting the possible, another by expecting the eternal, 
but he who expected the impossible became the greatest of all. Everyone shall be remembered, but everyone was great wholly in proportion to the magnitude of that with which he struggled. For he who struggled with the world became great by conquering the world, and he who struggled with himself became great by conquering himself, but he who struggled with God became the greatest of all. Thus did they struggle in the world, man against man, one against thousands, but he who struggled with God was the greatest of all. Thus did they struggle on earth. There was one who conquered everything by his power, and there was one who conquered God by his powerlessness. There was one who relied upon himself and gained everything. There was one who, in the security of his own strength, sacrificed everything. But the one who believed God was the greatest of all. There was one who was great by virtue of his power, and one who was great by virtue of his wisdom, and one who was great by virtue of his hope, and one who was great by virtue of his love. But Abraham was the greatest of all, great by that power whose strength is powerlessness, great by that wisdom whose secret is foolishness, great by that hope whose form is madness, great by that love that is hatred to oneself. I see yeah. when I when, when we say like he writes it well. Yeah, he, he really, really does. He really does. Can I read this other part that I thought was really good? Yeah. But Abraham had faith, and faith for this life. Yes, had his faith only been for a future life, it would indeed have been easier to cast everything aside in order to hasten out of this world to which he did not belong. But Abraham's faith was not of that kind, if there is a such. For a faith like that is not really faith, but only its remotest possibility, a faith that has some inkling of its object at the very edge of the field of vision, but remains separated from it by a yawning abyss in which despair plays at its pranks. But it was for this life that Abraham believed. He believed he would become old in his land, honored among his people, blessed in his kin, eternally remembered in Isaac, the dearest of his life, whom he embraced with a love for which it was but a poor expression to say that he had faithfully fulfilled the father's duty to love a son, as indeed the summons put, the son whom thou lovest. Jacob had twelve sons, and he loved one. Abraham just had one, the son he loved. And, ah, oh, dude, it's so well written. It's, it like blows your mind, man. Well, hey, do so, you might, what? I just have a quick question about that book. Yeah. Does he answer the question? What What's the question? How Abraham is great in willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. Oh, right. Well, isn't the question... Why God would ask? Why God would ask, right. I was reading something about this last night. Does he answer it or try? He says... He says something along the lines of an ethical imperative can be suspended in God's direct command. I think I remember that. Okay. That brings up another question of how do you know if it's God's command? Because right, how do you know would it something that conflicts with an ethical imperative mean that it's not God's command to us? Like if that if we were told that we would say that conflicts with this ethical imperative, therefore it's not God's command. I don't know what you mean. For example, if someone said that God told them to sacrifice their son today, we would say, no, 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 that wasn't God. Right. So my question is, how do you know? Especially with something so, on the face of it, horrible. Hmm. Well, so I think when we receive information or some sort of divine command today if God still works like that when we still receive when we receive some sort of command by God today we have his revelation on which to base the spirit of the command right that's true so we can 
look into his word and see if it aligns with his revealed character. Yeah. And see if the spirit of the command re- aligns with such. And Okay, that brings up a, a really big question. Okay. I agree that this happened before the law was given to Moses, which I think is a necessary distinction. But isn't God unchanging? Yes. Because I guess that the fact that Abraham didn't physically kill Isaac, sacrifice him, means that God isn't okay with human sacrifice. I think this was just because this was before the law was given there would be no way of knowing i don't know though so it we say god's not okay with human sacrifice and yet it's by human sacrifice that well i guess divine sacrifice divinely human sacrifice that we are redeemed right isn't it well yeah but think about it in judges whenever that guy was saying i'll sacrifice whatever walks through the yeah, door of Jephthah. my house first yeah and his Jephthah. daughter walks through and he's like ah oh, shoot i have to sacrifice her right but i think the difference in that is that we are not perfect so we would not be making any sort of atonement in a sacrificing another human and also if God doesn't approve of us sacrificing people, God can still sacrifice his son because his son is God. That's Jesus. But that also means that if God does not approve of us sacrificing people, he wouldn't approve of us sacrificing ourselves, which I think is why or this is part of the reason why we can't earn our way to heaven because even if we sacrifice everything we have even if we sacrifice ourselves it's not good that's enough that's not that's not good enough okay do you have anything else to say about that i don't think so i mean it's on the verge of what i want to talk about about myths and legends and history and stories okay before we get into that i'll just say everyone who's listening to this if there's anyone be prepared that'll be in the next podcast thank you okay